Good afternoon. This is the meeting of the Ordinance Committee for November 1st, 2016. Uh, we'll entertain any public comments. If there are any members of the public would like to comment. Okay. Seeing none, um, and there, there's a member of the public. Are you going to comment? Not uncenerable. Good. Uh, would you uh, take the roll, please, Madam Clerk? Council Member Rouse. Council Member Hotchkiss. Here. Council Member Murillo. Here. Okay, very good. And uh, who's giving the presentation today? Uh, Mr. Chair, my name's Kelly Dyer. I'm the water supply manager. And I have with me Dana Hoffenberg, who is a water resources specialist, who is in charge of implementing our water metering requirements for individual metering and irrigation meters. And uh, this came about in updates to Title 22, which is uh, environmental policy and construction. And there was uh, the staff is recommending that we move our water metering requirements from Title 22 over to Title 14, which is the water code. And we're, in, as part of that process, uh, taking the opportunity to clarify our, our language and make it more explicit, uh, particularly when we have uh, exceptions uh, or issues, issues with the current code. Good afternoon. My name is Dana Hoffenberg, and as Clay said, I am the Water Resources Specialist. So I'm going to be talking to you today about our, our ordinance that is updating our water metering requirements and moving our water metering requirements into Title 14, which is our Waters and Sewers chapter. So first, just a bit about the purpose today. So like we already mentioned, this is clarifying a lot of our existing metering requirements that we're already implementing. And we're also just making them a bit more explicit to aid in consistent enforcement and application of these requirements. We are adding some new requirements as well that have previously been a bit ambiguous in the code. And we are moving our water meeting requirements out of the building code, which is Title 22, and into our waters and sewers code, which is Title 14. So some additional background. Our meter requirements have traditionally been in the building code. They are local amendments to the Uniform Plumbing Code and the California Green Building Code. So we do have a residential water meter requirement, which basically says that each dwelling unit has to have its own water meter. And that requirement dates back to the early 90s. So that is one of the requirements that we are going to be moving. An additional requirement is a requirement regarding irrigation meters. Uh, that requirement was also in our building code, and that was adopted in 2013, and we will be moving that as well. So some more background on the codes. So our individual water meter requirement has been in place since the 90s, and it really is a very effective tool for water efficiency and conservation. It's a great communication tool with our customers since each dwelling unit has to be separately metered, basically each dwelling unit gets their own separate water bill. So they are able to see exactly how much water they are responsible for using and paying for. So that also increases our customer accountability for water use. Every tenant knows exactly what they're using and they are responsible for paying for what they're using. So it helps people you know, be more uh, water conservative. And also improves leak detection. So we know exactly what unit is having high water usage, so we are able to see in what unit there's an issue. Um, and we are able to help our you know, customers identify leak issues. Um, and then just some background on irrigation meters. So irrigation meters are meters that are dedicated just for outdoor water use. So it's to help people determine exactly how much water they're just applying to their landscaping. So those meters are just for outdoor watering purposes. Okay, so I'm not going to read this code to you, but this is just for reference what our existing metering code language looks like. It basically says that every dwelling unit has to have its own meter, and you know, commercial uses and non-commercial uses have to be metered separately. So if you see, it is rather brief. It's only two paragraphs. And so this isn't very helpful for us when, in terms of all the different kinds of circumstances we see in projects coming through the city. It's very hard for us to you know, apply all these different circumstances when we only have this amount of code to go off of. So some issues with the existing language. It is very brief and not very explicit. And this kind of ambig ambiguity doesn't lend itself to consistent enforcement, which you know, we definitely want to be consistent you know, for ourselves and then also for our applicants. 
It doesn't address some needed exemptions. For example, with the new higher density projects that we're seeing with the AUD program and things like that, there are some very, um, a lot of projects that have a lot of dwelling units, which means a lot of water meters. And a lot of times we can't fit all those water meters on the frontage of the street. So there's some exemptions that we need for that. You know, also exemptions for low income housing, things like that. And another issue with the code is it is located in the building code. So it uses references and vocabulary that makes sense for the building code, but often isn't compatible with what we classify our water customers as, and it just isn't really compatible with our water supply, you know, um, goals. Okay, so the first section that we have um, amended addresses the space issue. So what happens if there's not enough space at the curb line of the street at the frontage of the property to fit all of our water meters? So we do have a current administrative policy to allow a special configuration in those special circumstances for meter, sub-metering and master metering. Basically, it does allow our applicants to put our city-owned water meters on private property. Um, just for reference, there is new legislation that we are anticipating that the state is passing down that will be coming through in 2018 that does require individual metering, and it speaks a bit to sub-metering, so we will be coming back to you with any needed changes at that time. Okay, so the next section we've added, this is the section that really moves the meat of our separate metering ordinance into the water, waters and sewers title. So it includes our existing individual metering requirement for residential units. It also reflects a new state law that brings us into compliance with that law that basically limits our ability to regulate accessory dwelling units or things that are also known as granny units. We've also added an exemption for 100% affordable housing projects. This exemption, so it doesn't, it still limits them somewhat where they have to have one meter per six dwelling units instead of one meter per each dwelling unit. And so that's to balance our water conservation um, you know, goals while also recognizing that these are oftentimes you know, special tenants. They're either seniors or they're in transition housing or they have you know, mental health conditions. Um, so we don't really want to put burdens on these kinds of tenants, but we still want to conserve some of our water conservation goals. So that is why we do the one meter per six dwelling units. Okay, so this section really makes explicit that dwelling units converted to non-residential uses should be excuse me, metered separately from our residential uses. So this will affect our short-term rental or hotel conversion applicants. So originally, we directed all of these applicants that they would have to meter those hotels separately from residences. However, because our water meter requirements, as I've mentioned in the past, is located in the building code, there are some interesting definitions that the building code uses, which kind of created a loophole. Basically, it said that the hotels is the same type of occupancy as a residence, so we had to back up, back up back off on that requirement. Um, so now that our code is being moved into Title 14, our waters and sewers chapter, that loophole is being closed. So going forward, we are going to be requiring, based on this ordinance, that hotels be metered separately from residential uses. There is an exemption, however, that we are proposing, and I believe you have a handout with you um, in our original draft of the ordinance, unfortunately, we, were, we weren't able to include that exemption in time. So the language you have there is the amended language for Section 5 that includes an exemption for short-term rental applications that are already in the process, that are already in progress. They can be allowed to move forward with, um, you know, without having to be, to apply this, this standard. Okay, so the next section, it clarifies again that non-residential uses and residential uses should be metered separately. It also clarifies, so this is this next bullet is a bit of a, a new requirement. A lot of the requirements I have been talking about in the past have been just existing requirements that we're clarifying and updating. This one will be a new one. Um, in the past, the code has been a bit ambiguous in terms of if condominium units should be separately metered or commercial condominium units should be separately metered. So this clarifies that that would be a requirement that because they're technically separate legal properties, those condos should have their own water meter. 
Okay, and this is our irrigation meter requirement. Um, it basically says that irrigation meters are required for landscapes with an irrigated area of over 1,000 square feet, and it consolidates our existing city requirement that was located in Title 22 <clears throat> with a state water code requirement. And so our, co our code is quite old. Um, you know, there's some sections that are over 40 years old, so there is some just basic cleanup needed. So these sections are, you know, more standard changes, some amendments to word choice, section reference updates, that kind of thing. So if you have any specific questions on these sections, I'd be happy to answer them, but they're a bit more, you know, standard. Okay, so our timeline. So today we're with you at Ordinance Committee, we are planning to introduce this to the council next week and then to be adopted the sub subsequent week, and it will go into effect January 1st. So our timeline is a bit tight um, since with the um, building code amendments, our requirement has been taken out of the building code, so our water meeting requirements will be struck from Title 22 as of January 1st. So we want to make sure that we get this ordinance in on time so there's not you know, a gap where we don't have water metering uh, requirements. Can I be happy to answer any questions that you have? Any questions from the committee? Ms. Murillo? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks <clears throat> for the presentation. So I, I see in the, um, the exempt, ex exceptions here. Uh, so if someone has submitted a complete application related to a short-term rental as of today, right? Correct, yes. Um, so it doesn't have to have been approved, just submitted as of November 1st. Okay, that, I, I can see how that was hanging out there. I'm glad, you, I'm glad you included that. I've never heard the expression commercial condo. What, what does that mean? Right, it's a bit odd. So it is a condominium unit, like you would you know, know what a residential unit would be, but it is just used for commercial uses. Oh, okay. So, I mean, Scott, if, I don't know the exact definition, but he might be able to answer it a bit more in depth than I would be able to. Mr. Vincent. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, uh, commercial condominium units are parts of typically mixed-use buildings. Uh, in the last 15, 20 years, we've had many mixed-use buildings built. Uh, you can have that they can be separated between the commercial uses and the residential uses, and you're, you know, people are familiar with residential condominiums being on the second, third, and, you know, and higher floors. You can also split commercial condominiums as well. They can be, and they, they can be split up uh, either prospectively or subdivided later. Uh, and it can be, they can be on a fixed square footage basis or it can be subdivided where any number of condominiums can at a later date be uh, subdivided up to a maximum number uh, in, that complies with the uh, minimum zoning requirements. You're so knowledgeable, thank you. Um, this sounds very straightforward, but I know we have a public speaker, so I'll, I'll just end there. That's all the questions I had. Thank you. Mr. Hodgkins. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> you mentioned on slide eight uh, a burden for seniors. What burden are you talking about? Limits burden of tenants while preserving conservation benefit. What's the burden? Well, you're speaking to the, the, affordable ho the exemption for affordable housing. I think what we're getting at is that a lot of these affordable housing projects, we, I mean, so the separate metering requirement basically allows each tenant to pay their own water bill. So these tenants that are in these affordable housing projects, if, you know, they're low-income seniors, maybe they're not capable of paying their own water bill. So it might be, you know, the housing authority or some other, you know, whoever's administering the project that would pick up their water bill anyways. So we don't, you know, we don't want to, we don't want to have the precedent of saying, you know, tenants have to pay their, those kinds of tenants have to pay their own water bill. But somebody's got to pay it. Who pays it if they don't? It, well, it depends on the project. Um, in this sense, it, if it's a housing authority project, it might be the housing authority that pays the bill. Right. Joshua. Mr. Chair, um, this is, we've, we've come across this issue before. People self-help is a perfect example. They're providing either help with transition, you know, tr transitioning people back into from drug abuse or whatever. They're not going to be there for a prolonged period of time. It doesn't make sense to put a meter in their name. Typically, it goes to people's self-help, and they 
cover that bill. We just did some senior housing in which it's, it's basically they're living on their own, sort of, but electricity, gas, water is being paid for by people's self-help. But uh, so what we've, we've kind of did is a compromise where we want to have some uh, understanding that of uh, you know, it's no more than six units have a meter. And so there's, we can tell if there's a running toilet, you can tell if there's some unusual behavior that it might require people self help to look into it. But individual metering on those little tiny units, they typically don't have a full uh, kitchens typically in that places too. It, it, it's really unwarranted. And so we're trying to find a strike that, that balance to it. Mm -hmm. Now, do these metering changes go into effect starting now or are they retroactive in any way? These would affect new construction, um, and this ordinance specifically goes into effect January 1st. A lot of these, though, requirements are existing, so they're things we have already been doing and have been doing in the past, but this ordinance specifically will go into effect January 1st. So w w would this require any, and if so, how many um, new meters as of now or as, as of the time we pass it? Could you say new, that New water meters to be installed? It would require new water meters for any new projects that are being That's constructed. new projects, so. Yes, yes. So it, it, this isn't going to require, you know, existing apartment buildings to go back and redo all of their plumbing and install new meters. That's correct. Thank you. Uh, so, so I understand it. So the, is, this is coming out of the building code and into the water department. Is that? Mr. Chair, that's correct. So in that case, so the, the cost for a meter uh, would be a part of the budget within the water department? Is that how that's going to work? Mr. Chair, the uh, installation of new meters is paid by the property owner. I was just wondering about things like 218 notices for raising the cost of a meter, that kind of thing. Is that? Mr. Chair, these are uh, part of what are called the buy-in fees, which are not uh, Prop 218 noticed, but they have other separate noticing requirements. Uh, so they're a one-time fee paid for connection to the right. the water system. Okay. I just wonder if we're going to see it in a different place in the budget as we go forward or that's no. All righty. Um, and uh, as I recall from your presentation, the state law precludes separate meeting of a grant, uh, separate metering of a granny unit. Is that, or is that to be anticipated from the new state law? Mr. Chair, I, I'll take the, that question. Uh, recent amendments to the, to the state statute that uh, concerned what we call secondary dwelling units, which will now be called accessory dwelling units, uh, precludes communities from charging those capacity fee charges that you were just discussing as far in connection with a new meter if the accessory dwelling unit is constructed within the footprint of an existing building. You cannot charge a capacity charge or require a new meter for an accessory dwelling unit that is contained within an existing building. If the new accessory dwelling unit is in a detached structure, separate and apart from existing structures, then the city can require a separate meter for that unit as well as charge the capacity fee charge. Thank you for the clarification. And my last one is, and this is a little off topic, but is, is something that's hot button right now. You said hotel versus residential use. And as we consider the R4 and the different controversies around that, can you define that for me in a more, as uh, so, a so hotel use? And I mean, I have a kind of intuitive thing what that means. But the other side of the coin is we say to people who want to convert VRBO, STRs and the R4, that should become now a commercial use which is a, a hotel and not a residential use, but I'm, that's, I, I would like some clarification if I could. Uh, maybe sure. Mr. Vincent would be the one to. So, Mr. Chair, the confusion comes up where you have building code occupancies and you have zoning designations. Zoning designations differ between what we call residential uses and commercial uses, a transient occupancy, a hotel use. So when you, when you hear a conversion from a dwelling unit to a hotel use as being a conversion from a residential use to a commercial use, that's a zoning designation. That comes out of Title 28. It's a zoning issue. The building code doesn't recognize that distinction. The building code talks about residential uses or R occupancies and lumps many hotel projects into that R occupancy. 
So a conversion in that respect doesn't move you from, a, in the building code parlance, doesn't move you from a residential use to a commercial use. You're still in that R occupancy for purposes of how those buildings are constructed. This, the, the amendments that are being proposed in this, by taking these, these regulations, these water, uh, the water metering regulations out of Title 22, putting it in Title 14 of the Municipal Code, removes some of that, the, the, um, the confusion that's you know, uh, occurring between the zoning designations and the building code classifications. In addition, the, zone, the, the water division's nomenclature for their fees, you have to remember, water division has residential uses, commercial uses, agricultural uses, and industrial. So the the water division's fee, fee resolution matches up more closely to the zoning designations. And so this, we are hoping that one of the benefits from removing these regulations from Title 22, putting them into Title 14, not only do you find it at the same place where you find your other re rules and regulations regarding water use, but it will also be one more step for in resolving that confusion between the zoning designations and the building code classifications. Okay, very good. Well, the rest of my questions involve uh, subject creep, so I'll stay away from it right for now and stay on the water. Um, any further questions from uh, the committee? We have a public speaker, uh, Jared Gordon. We have two minutes at the podium. Good afternoon, council members. I'm Jarrett Gorin from Vanguard Planning, and we are processing a number of these short-term vacation rental applications right now. We've actually gotten a couple through, um, but we have many in process, and Dana has been doing a really good job keeping us apprised of everything that's going on here because it's changed a few times since even some of our applications have been in process. Um, she sent me an email yesterday that was explaining this exemption for projects that are in process. Um, the way she described it was that if an application's been submitted and paid for a planner consultation, it would be exempt from these new requirements. And we're, we're fully in support of that. Um, the, the planner consultation process is lengthy. Uh, we have two applications that what you're considering today would affect directly, and our applications for a planner consultation were submitted on June 30th, two of them, um, and we just received our letter from staff on October 24th for one of them and have yet to receive it on the other one of them. And the reason I bring this up is that if, if staff had been more timely in responding to us, we certainly could have then made the formal application and had it deemed complete by now. Whereas at this point, it would be virtually impossible for us to get back staff's feedback from the pre-consultation, submit a formal application, and get it deemed complete before a January 1st cutoff. And the, the wording I'm hearing being discussed here today is application deemed complete. And that's very different than an application having been submitted for a pre-consultation. And I want to be really clear on, on what we're talking about here because it, it makes a huge difference. And, and, and if we're going to cut people off at completeness for an application, I really feel that's unfair because if we weren't required to go through this mandatory process that effectively delayed us for five months, we'd be complete on both of these applications by now. Um, and not subject to the very large fees that there are for new meters. So those are my comments. A question, Mr. Hodgkins. I, Mr. I have a question for you. How many people, uh, or you know, do you represent that are actually in this process? I, I had heard that was very few. Oh, I probably have ten clients on my own that are going through this process at various stages. Converting from residents to short-term vacation rentals. So they're in the R4 area? In R4. Some of them are in C2. Okay. They're all in areas that are obviously allowed under the ordinance. Only two of the people that I have right now, though, would really be impacted by this because my understanding is if it's an individual unit where there's just one unit, it is not subject to this. Is that accurate? But this affects 
cases where you have, let's say, three units in a current, let's say, apartment building, and you want to convert one of the three units to a short-term vacation rental, but leave the other two as residential, now we've got this mixed-use situation, which I fully understand why the city wants to have separate meters going forward on that, but for people that started this process with a set of assumptions on costs to then have this change come in, and, and be subject to it because we were delayed by staff just not being able to handle applications fast enough, um, that's that's an issue. What kind of costs are you talking about? Well, the buy-in fees for the smallest meter that you can get, a 5 eighths inch meter, and this is a residential, I don't even know what it is for commercial, but on residential, uh, it's around $14,000 to pay the buy-in fees and for water and sewer and the meter fee and everything else. So that's that's a significant cost. Yeah. Okay, good. Thank you. Ms. Mario. Thank you. Well, how I'm reading it, it says projects converting a dwelling unit to a short-term rental hotel that submitted a complete application for a planner consultation and the paid fees for such consultation on or before November 1st shall not be subject. So it, it sounds like you just had to have had submitted a complete application for a planner, for a planner consultation. consultation okay if that's the wording then I, that's we're fully in support of that done that you've okay mr. And did you pay your fee yeah of course mr vincent might want to weigh in on us mr chair members of the committee the 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 way we're what we're talking about is section five of the proposed ordinance it's an uncodified section that d details the implementation and effectiveness of the ordinance provisions the, the default rule is that we intend to have this ordinance effective on January 1st, 2017. We also detail two exceptions to that as to if you have a project that one has been deemed complete on or before December 31st, 2016, known as before the effective date of the ordinance, that project may continue to proceed in accordance with the provisions of tw Title 22 as they existed prior to the effective date of this ordinance. In the case, uh, and then there's a specific case, the, so that rule regarding application completeness covers any project. If a project's been deemed complete, then it can continue to proceed again along with the rules as they exist today. Specifically, we carved out a second exception that deals with the, sh the conversion of dwelling units to short-term rentals, recognizing that there is a different process, that the process is complicated, and both the city and applicants are working their way through that process. So we acknowledge the fact that, that there are some projects that have gone through this planning consultation process but have not yet reached the project application completeness. So if a project has submitted for a a planning consultation and paid the required fees on or before today, they can continue with the rules as they exist today. If they haven't done that, then starting on January 1, they will be required to follow the new rules. Thanks for clarifying that. Yeah, we're, we're fully in support of that, and we think that's a fair way to handle it. Thank you. May I made a, make a motion then to... You may. Yes. Other comments? Go right ahead. Let me see Please how you. they phrased it for us. That we forward this to council, an introduction of uh, this ordinance amending the municipal code chapters 14.04, 14.08, updating and clarifying water metering requirements, adding exist existing water metering requirements previously located in chapter 22.04. Second. Okay, all in favor, aye. 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 Any opposed? So ordered. And yes, we'll move on to council. Thank you. We're adjourned. <laughs>